Thanks for coming out. Uh, this talk's um, next level Git, just make sure you're in the right place. Um, we're going to be going over some intermediate to advanced Git topics. So about us, um, I'm Mark Faree. I'm the director of engineering at Chapter 3. I use Git every day. I have been for probably six or seven years. Um, and every day, even yesterday, you know, going through our slides, learn some new things. So, you know, Git is as deep as you want to go. And so we're going to try to share some of the things we've learned, um, you know, picking through Git. Um, I'm Brad Erickson, and I make a lot of things on the internet, as a, just like everyone else here. So, the history of Git, Git's a distributed version control system created in 2005 by Linus Torvald for Linux kernel development when no existing options provided the required features. If you'd like to read the quote, that's where the name came from. So, oh, if you'd like to read the quote, that's where the name of Git came from. Oh, it's much louder now. <laughs> so uh, we have some prerequisites to make sure you are aware so that you understand everything that's being covered in the rest of this. We need some working knowledge of Git from the command line. You must know the following commands and their usage. Uh, clone, checkout, add, commit, push, pull. So every, everything you would use if you use Pantheon or Acquia for developing your Drupal sites. So no, normal, you know, SVN level, you know, Git usage. Got a bit of a glossary just to make sure you get, you're in the right place. Uh, VCS, version control system, the commit, uh, repo or repository, which we'll use interchangeably, tag, and branch. So, so um, you know, th these are the common terminology used across all version control systems. So, you know, we're, we're expecting that, you know, when we throw these words out that you'll, you'll know what we're talking about. All right, some useful commands. One you may have seen right now is a tagging of commits. Like most, version, like most version control systems, Git has the ability to tag specific points in the history as being important. It's just a, it's a way to name it. So that if you have an important commit, such as most commonly used as a uh, version number, you're gonna give it a name. Uh, if there's other important bits of history throughout the Git commit time, you can add in uh, just to give it a name such as this is the time we changed something. So in this case, it's just adding a, a tag for version 1.0. Uh, tag, tags are an add-on. If you notice in, in the example here, we also have hashes. So everything that happens in Git gets a hash. And, and by hash, it's a really long, unique string. Um, so you see the commit, you know, LDA177E4C. So that's designed to be unique within that repository. So, you know, the, the tag is just a bookmark for that hash. So tags don't have any other special features. They're just you know, giving you another name for a place and time in the repository. Another great one, uh, git diff. This is probably I, every time before I'm making a commit, I just want to check to make sure that I've only changed what I want to change. So git shows the differences between the commits, between the stage, or your current working directory, or different branches. Be aware of it. So um, git log is probably where I spend the most of my time. Um, I, I look at code a lot more than I write code these days. So git log has a huge, huge number of flags. The one I actually, I actually have my you know, bash file set up to pass p every time. So when you pass um, dash p, you get git log. And instead of just getting the commit name and the commit message, uh, if, if you just have the commit message there, you're relying on the developer to have put something useful. This actually shows you what changed in what file, and even, even um, throws a small diff underneath it. So this output's a lot more useful if you're actually trying to get you know, a real idea of what happened. Nice little short history. This is a equivalent to a change log. If you don't have it, your project doesn't have a change log. And that's just git log uh, dash dash one line. And you can see that it's just gonna list off the, li uh, the kit commit subjects from each of your commits. So get what changed uh, is actually just a shorthand for another you know, whole collection of log flags. 
um, what changed shows you the individual files and whether or not there was an addition or a modification. So um, rather than showing you the diff, if a lot of files were changed in a single commit, this one might be a little bit more easy to process. So um, I, I use these all interchangeably depending on what mood I'm in and what I'm trying to look at. Gets mood sensitive. Yeah. Uh, then everyone's favorite command, if you haven't used it yet, it will be your favorite, is git blame. You want to see who did what and why. So look here, we know the Dries, and there's Nathan down there on line seven. Line seven, excuse me, eight, it's Nathan. Uh, but this is just useful if you need to see why and why, how, when something happened and what, what was changed. So uh, git stash um, takes, takes you down a different uh, road. So previously, we were actually just looking at history, trying to par parse history, figure out what happened in the repository. With stash, we we're actually doing some of our own work. And so um, I, I tend to have very fragmented days. I'm across a bunch of different projects. So when I open a repo and start typing, a lot of times I, like, am, my thoughts are incomplete. I don't have working code. And I need to you know, check out a different branch and look at something different. So stash is your best friend when you get stuck in this situation. So what stash allows you to do is without committing your changes and you know, saying that this is something I actually want to keep, you can just shove it over to the side. Um, it gives you a collection of stashes that you can list out. And um, what it basically says is, I forget what I was changing, or I'm not sure I really even want this yet, but I may want to bring it back in the future. So you can, you can push it to the side and then go work on something clean. Uh, the main time I have to use this is when um, I'm trying to pull in some, something that conflicts with what I have in my stash. You know, like maybe me and another developer are working on the same HD access file. You know, the production site's down. We've got a redirect loop in the HD access file. We're both working on it. It's like I want to see his changes that he just pushed that brought back up the prod server, but I may want to introduce my changes back you know, so that we get HTTPS working properly. So shove it to the side, quickly pull in another change, and then you can list out you know, the different stashes you have in your history. Uh, another one is the amend uh, option on commit. It's super useful when you've just re you just remembered at the last second after you've finished that commit that there is a debug message in or some minor little CSS change. Before you push, it's often quite easy just to go and make the change to the file, uh, get add it, and then you can get commit update, which will uh, replace the re previous commit with a new one. And then be careful. Don't amend the published commits that every, everyone else on your team already has access to. Unless that's already been discussed and you know what's happening. Or you want to spend half your day you know, recovering from that mistake. Just like uh, related to that is there is a force push. And this can be over, overwrites the remote branch history with your local history. Uh, you can delete your entire remote branch and even your entire repository with this command. Some repository hosts won't let you force push, uh, but the majority will, such as uh, Bitbucket, GitHub, you can delete entire repository with this, or you can rebuild your history to remove passwords that were stored years ago that shouldn't be published. Oh, and a new one, new for this talk, is uh, bisect. Uh, and the definition of bisect, just to be clear, is divide into two parts. When you have a project and you need to look, go back into the history and find why something, again, why something happened and a specific time that something broke so you know that it was related to this issue and the, the, just the entire history of what caused this to be changed, what you can do is go step by step and pull out, check out this commit, check out this commit, check out this commit, but that's inefficient. You don't want to do that. So instead what we have is a system that uses a binary search and you say git bisect start, and then say the, the point at which everything went bad as, a, as the git hash, and then the current tag, or the current hash where everything is good, and you'll do an optimized search by going through this one, then this one, then this one, to come down to that one commit where it first went bad. It's particularly useful in a really busy repository. Uh, I don't know who's planning on going to the sprints tomorrow, but um, you know, the commits are going to start flying in really fast to Drupal core. And um, you know, knowing when a change happened, when you've got 10 people pushing things and a lot, a lot of stuff happening, can, can get really complicated. So um, 
you, you really want bisect when it's, uh, I know something went wrong at some point between last Thursday and today, and I've got 100 commits to look at. So it'll help you work through that a lot more quickly. And there's a good reference there. WebChip wrote a real nice Drupal-centric little tutorial on yeah, it. The core devs love this one. Now we're going to get some story time. So uh, using incorrect git incorrectly effectively, it can work. If you have two users on the same branch, one's going to check out the, the, the current head. Uh, this is the green one here. One's going to check out, the, oh, I can't do that. The, the current tip, they're going to make a change and then push it up to master. The next user will pull out their change and start and continue from there. It works fine as long as there's no overlap. Ex right, like this. We have some failed, failed to push some refs. I think we've all seen this message when someone else is working on it and you've, you're fighting back and forth, everyone adding little commits here, little commits there for the last bit of CSS that need to be changing on a project. And so we, the, I mean, the important thing to remember here is like the power of Git is the fact that it can branch so easily and so well and merge those branches in. So if you're only working on one branch, you're basically using Git just like a 20-year-old version control system. Like you're not, you're not getting any of the benefits from Git. So um, create branches often, you know, use them creatively. Like there's, there's no reason for everybody to work off of master unless you're the only person on the repository. So here's an example of what happens when two people are working on the, the same exact branch. You have one user makes a commit, and now that other user has a new, new commit, but they're branched out of, out of uh, consistency. It's out of sync. The common solution that, is, that you see many people do is just do a git pull. That's the same as a fetch and then merge. It makes a merge commit. It makes a messy history. And what happens is all of those merges, if you normally have more than this graphic shows, will be shoved together. And so you can't tell what, there's no, there's no history together, there's no story. And I, I'm sure, uh, you know, I work on a lot of Drupal projects. I, I know a lot of those histories look exactly like this. You know, a lot, a lot of times when you're working on a Drupal site, like all you're using Git for is like a, you know, a collection of the history. So um, it's, bad, but it's not as bad as not using version control at all. So, you know, don't feel, feel too bad. Just understand that there is a better way you can make your life easier if you use Git more fully in the future. So, the reasons, specific reasons to avoid. Creates an extra merge commit. Introduces greater risk of merge conflicts. And a messy history makes problems more difficult to track. So, there's a better solution. So, so, so this is kind of your first baby step to understanding like the power of Git branches. Um, from my perspective, you know, the more complicated you make your development workflow, uh, the more you can slow a project down with your workflow. So, you know, you, you really want to take these as baby steps. Um, you know, everybody working off master introduces its own set of issues. You're, you're resolving merge conflicts more often. You're stepping on each other's toes, and the history is more confu confused. So, this gives you a nice baby step, which is we're going to call a branch dev. Everybody's going to work on that branch, but we can then safely do production pushes by merging into master. So we can all collectively decide that dev is in a good space today. We're going to push it to production tomorrow, so we can merge it into master, tag that merge commit on master, and that's going to be our production release for the next day. So we get the benefit of branches because um, the production branch at the top what our master is our production branch in this example, it sits there um, ready for a hot fix. So if I have a one line change I know I need to push to production right now, I, I don't have to sort out the like week and a half of dev work that's happening on the dev branch. I can ignore it completely, hot fix master, and you know move on with my life and just merge that back down to the dev branch. So you know it's still there when we we merge again back up to. So this is sort of like your first intro to branching. Like, it's a nice way to, you know, if, if you're thinking about bringing this back to your team, it's a nice way to get everyone started understanding the benefits of branching. So here's the best solution. Everybody gets their own branches. The second branch is, is, uh, is rebased. And we'll teach you, I'll cover rebase in a moment. 
then merge back to master when features are complete. This is the correct way, the recommended way to work on GitHub and Bitbucket or GitLab. So what happens is both users start at that same commit. They both make their own feature. User A finishes feature A first. They mer it gets merged back to mas master. And so then what can happen is user B uses a feature called rebasing. And what it does is it changes your base commit. And you can see in the graphic that their commits are uh, replayed. So that the, the history and the, you could call the, the, the story of the project stays linear. So instead of in a merge where it gets shoved together, it's this one, and now this one gets stacked up on top. The, the two pieces stay in order. And then later when it's all merged, you get a clean history, and you only end up with one merge when the new feature's brought in. Could be, good chance, good eye. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember our color conventions. I don't, <laughs> yeah. So, um, like, like I said, you know, creating and then um, sorting out your branches is actually really simple and straightforward. It, it can be like an easy, quick part of your workflow. So, um, my example I gave about Stash. The smarter way for me to do that would be to not be working on master in the first place, but I should have just created a branch for what I was thinking, and I could have given that branch a really good name for what I was working on. So, you know, that branch can sit there for three months until I get back to what I was thinking, you know, especially if you're working on the README. That's not usually the high priority, you know, work that you're doing on the repository, but, you know, you always want to update your README. So I can start doing some typos and some edits to the README, and I don't have to put that back into the main repository until I'm ready for it. So, you know, I, I can have a local branch. I can also push that branch remotely so other people can tackle that same README work. But, you know, we, we then have like a nice sandbox to work together in. Now, just clean up your messes. Delete your branches when you're done with them. Uh, branches can be used for new features, temporary tests, or quick backups. But when you're done, it's quite easy to get rid of them. And that way you can see what, what's over, what still needs to be dealt with. You might have a feature that's been, long, oh, it's been worked on for a long period of time, and you need to work on it, it needs to be done. But afterwards, we don't need to deal with it anymore. And so uh, Git keeps track of what's been merged and what's not been merged. So you, can't, you have to force, effectively force delete a branch when it's, been, uh, when it's not been merged. And when it has been merged, it's just going to get quickly deleted. Do the next slide. Um, oh, so, so, so the process for merging branches uh, is um, you, so I, I like to edit my command line. Um, there's a lot of tutorials online for doing this, where it actually shows you in your command line which branch you're currently in. I have even more information about the repository, but it's super helpful to know before you push um, not, not to have to remember to run a command to know which branch you're in, because it can get confusing when you're thinking about all these branches in your head, which one merges where, which one's in a current state. So checking out the one you want to merge into and then merging, merging the other ones is a typical flow, but there's nothing to stop you from doing it the other direction. So just keep in mind having, having that in com your command line so you know which branch you're on and you know, thinking carefully about how you're merging you know, it's important. It's easy to screw up. The, the nice part is with Git until you push, you're usually local. And you can always step back and rethink your decision. So um, like Brad mentioned, Git keeps track of what's been merged and what hasn't. So this gives you a good idea of sort of the status of your local work as well as remote work. So if you pass the dash R, it includes remote branches. Um, if you um, don't pass any flag, to this, you get just um, your local merged and not merged. So if, if you're getting really organized, you know, I don't know, you have a bunch of Jira tickets assigned to you, and you made a branch for each ticket assigned to you, you can really quickly see, like, how's my week doing? Like, am I on track to get this work done just with running one command on the command line? So if you want to make some merge conflicts, <laughs> What you do is um, change the same line in two separate branches. Uh, Git is really, really good at handling merging 
when separate files have been changed or completely separate lines. But when it's the same line in two separate branches and you try to merge them, you're, this is where it's going to cause a merge conflict. This is especially painful when you work a lot on CSS um, because changing the same line is, is way more common. Uh, Linus doesn't write CSS, so he didn't really think about that use case when he was writing, writing the tool. So un unfortunately, you know, you, you might have to sort out some of those merge conflicts. So th this is how you go about tackling that. So um, you know, there's a couple of ways you can go through this. You can do it in a more interactive step way, especially if you have a lot of merge conflicts, that might be a way to go. I, I personally prefer to go at it from this angle, which is I, I find my status, I know I'm in a merge conflict, I get both modified, which means that um, Git wasn't smart enough to resolve this. Like Git typically resolves like 90% of, of what's in the repository. It has a lot of strategies for dealing with different conflicts it comes across, but when it can't figure it out, it needs your input. So what it does is it manually modifies the file, throws in the, these, you know, um, greater than, less than, equal signs to let you know which branch has the change and what's the changes in each branch. And so in this example, you know, we're trying to, uh, you know, make this copy script um, thing uh, cross-browser by just, you know, changing the, changing the name from macOS to Linux. And we changed it in two files, and then we tried to merge them back together. So in this case, if we were good software engineers, we'd have two separate branches that live separate from each other forever you know, because we don't want our Mac configuration to break our Linux configuration. So there's uh, many remotes. Uh, the source repository when you clone a project is called your origin remote. That's just by convention. You can rename it and call it anything else you'd like. When you first do the remote, you, you clone down a project initially and you check the git remote and, that's called, and that'll be called origin. Or, origin is just a special keyword. Um, it doesn't do anything, um, you know, particular. It's just it's just a naming convention. And so uh, we've got a little graphic here, so you can see that that origin remote has been brought down as your local copy of the repository, and they're they're the same at this point. And so a common use case is you got two users and one remote. They both have access, and in both cases, the same repository is their remote origin. You're going to push to it, you're going to pull to it, you're going to cause some merge conflicts. So up to this point, everything we've been describing is typically you're working on one repository. So it's all the tools for everybody working together in one repository. And, you know, what um, people have realized is, you know, gets more powerful than that. You know, you can have a lot of you know, a lot of copies of a repository. You're not stuck with just one copy of the repository. So what we're discussing here in this section goes beyond everything we just discussed and starts to add multiple repositories to the mix. Yeah, and this is a different view of the same idea. It's really hammered in. So this is how you're going to do it most commonly again on the, uh, any of the hosting providers. You will fork the, um, the project and create your own, your own version of it so that what happens is you have one user that owns a project and then another user has their fork and they work against their fork. The, the nice part about Git is you always can have everything locally and you probably should. Um, and so if for some reason tomorrow, you know, um, the CIA went into the GitHub offices and shut down their servers, if you had pulled right before that happened, you would have everything in your repository and you could republish that somewhere else. And so, you know, Git, you know, wants you to be able to work from an airplane and do everything you would do if you had an internet connection. And so your, your local forked copy is an exact copy of everything from that project as long as you pulled it down completely. So when you're working like this, the user two, this is just the world according to user two. You pull down changes from upstream into your local master, you push changes to origin, your fork, and then merge changes upstream or you create a pull request. So that at no point are you, uh, at no point are you going to push directly to the original upstream. And this is the standard way to work on every, every major project on GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab. 
And so this is the, a question that many people have constantly, is how do I update when you have a fork, how do you get that, that fork back into your, your fork or the original project? And so they're changes up to master. How do you bring those changes to your fork's master branch? Uh, what I do is I add, at this point we say in git remote and there's no remotes. Git remote add upstream and the original project name. Now, git remote update will bring down that upstream remote and any updates to the origin remote. You'll have both of them on your, on your machine. So you check out the master branch because you haven't been working on the master branch or on a feature branch and you pull upstream master. And that will pull in all the changes to upstream master and then now when you do a git push, it's gonna, re it's gonna update your uh, origin master. So then now it's gonna be in sync and now you can rebase or do whatever you need to do versus your feature branch. In the, in the Drupal world, an example of this would be um, if um, you know, your company has its own private GitHub, but you're also hosting the production site on Pantheon. So Pantheon might be your origin. You know, you're going you're gonna to merge in all the changes from Pantheon, but you know, you're also, you're also going to have a, a copy of the repository on GitHub because that's where your continuous integration runs. You know, you, maybe you're using Travis CI. So you know, you're, you're able to um, use remotes. There's no limit to the number of remotes you could have. You can, um, I know on big uh, GitHub projects, people will check out other developers' remotes um, their, their forks, just so that they can check out other people's work that's happening over here. It doesn't really affect my work, but maybe I just want to go look at what they're doing. So you could have seven, eight, 20 remotes and, and just swap between them, merge between them. They're all started from the same repository, so most of the code should be shared. So uh, Drupal is in many cases, you're working on GitHub or GitLab and you're aware of what pull requests are, but some of you aren't. Uh, pull requests is a request to pull your changes. This isn't something that uh, is part of Git. This is a, something added to the UI tools that we're all using as a nice formality uh, to discuss the, the change. Uh, you create a pull request when you have new commits in a project or a fork which should be pulled into the original project. It's a straightforward idea, but it's something that's not necessarily part of Git itself. Now we'll get some fun. This is rebasing, and I've made up this definition with the capitalization in it, because it, there isn't a better one that I've seen. Yeah, don't bother reading the man page for rebase you know, on the git command line. It's not, it's not worth your time. Oh, yeah. it, it is. <laughs> Read the fine manual. Uh, a merge generally creates a single commit with two parents, and it's a nonlinear history. That's what I was saying, is that you get all of those commits, you got commits from this, commits from this, and they, they're all gonna be overlapping. A rebase, it takes that original, that original one, and yours, it's gonna come over here and stacks it on top, it, and it replays each one of them. So that commits for each feature stay together. It also, and that process uh, resolves a lot of merge conflicts more easily because you're gonna be each, each commit, instead of having, if you have 50 new commits, instead of having to resolve all of those at one time, you can just say, I'm gonna resolve just this one commit merge conflict and then the next one and the next one through that, the entire rebase process. A, a regular merge is kind of like the lazy version. It's like, you know, I, I trust Git, it's a really powerful tool, it's really great at resolving merge conflicts, I'm just gonna smash it all together and hope it handles it well. Whereas a rebase is like you as somebody who's trying to add a feature to a project, really thinking about, is this message useful? Are these commits useful packaged together? Does this actually solve the whole problem I'm trying to solve? So you're actually like making that decision point, like this, this is ready to go, it's packaged up, and I'm, I'm gonna run it right on top of the current history of the project and, and clean it up before I do it. In many cases, this is required for a pull request to be merged in a lot of projects. And they won't accept a merge. So remember this from the, for the first time? This is how you do it, this is what it looks like. It's really close to what you're doing with a merge, just you're using the rebase command instead. So the commands are you check out feature B, 
Then you rebase versus master instead of, instead of merge versus master. And so all your commits are, your commits are getting play, played back on top. Now you can push force because if you've been working in your feature branch and you know, push or pushing early and often, that your feature branch is going to be out of date. So what you need to do is force it, and this is where it's acceptable to do it because this is your feature, you own it, your fork, overwrites your previous history. Now you check out master and you can merge master or this is the point where you're going to make a pull request based on your new feature branch. So uh, like, like I said, the, the whole reason for this is not just to you know, be correct in terms of the timeline of the project. The reason is that you're actually going to think about how you're presenting this work. So um, you know, any, anybody here a front end developer, you raise your hand. So you, you guys are all guilty of really short commit messages that get fired in really frequently. I, I know it from previous experience. So you, we can actually squash those into something relevant. And nobody has to know that you are just you know, actually moving the same thing around for two hours up and down. <laughs> it, so um, re Rebase gives you the opportunity to um, you know, package your work and present it as you know, a complete whole. So um, if you get log one line, we'll show you everything you've been working on in this feature branch. Um, but what we're going to learn how to do is squash these together. So um, when you rebase interactively, it presents this screen to you. So um, it, it finds everything on your feature branch, and it finds all those commits. And hopefully you've been giving at least relatively good messages so you can tell them apart from the screen and you don't actually have to go and find a history elsewhere to, to find out what you changed. And now, now you have the opportunity to start um, working through these changes and, and figuring out how you're going to deal with them. And the first thing you do, well, the only thing you do is if you look at the bottom of the commands here, Git is real nice and shows you the different commands. There's pick, reword, edit, squash, fix up, and exec. Uh, in this case, we're just going to be squashing, and what that does is you have a, when you have that little merge, you have that little CSS fix that you forgot, or the little debug, what you can do is squash it back into the previous one and bring your headers and, and bring all your commits together. So in this project, we currently have six commits, and we're, what we're going to do is take out three of them and get rid of them, the minor edit, the minor edit, and the minor readme edit, to just make those, pretend those never happened. So what you do is just edit whatever your text editor is, change pick to squash, squash, squash. Now save and exit. Git is going to exit, come right back with a new editor, and allow you to adjust your commit message. Because you have that new feature, and in this case, I would just comment out or delete these minor edits. And then the same thing before, and we've got originally those six commits, the six useless commits have now been turned into three useless commits. <laughs> uh, the process is, uh, you know, it's, after you've done it a couple times, and you can do this in little simple, uh, you know, new, make a new repo and try it out, it, it becomes second nature. Another good example here is uh, a real simple more than amend, when you need to do an amend on the most recent commit, you type git commit amend, and it'll bring up the editor and you can change the commit message. But if you need to go back into the history and add something, maybe the, a link to the Stack Overflow post that told you why you were going to do, do it this specific way, it's a good place if it's not in your uh, code itself, is you can use the edit command. And the same process, git rebase, give it an older uh, commit hash, and change, it to, change the command to edit. In that, in that process, and that's what these commands are doing, we're going to show, it shows the git log, showing the rebase, and now git commit amend is going to open the editor, and at that point you can go and change what the commit message is, and rebase, continue the rebase, okay, we're done, and now we can see that what was new feature is now new feature, more details to message. So um, you know, part, part of the basis for using Rebase for going back through and editing these things is you know, when you're working quickly and all, all you really want to do is just be keeping track of your own changes for your own head, like I'm going back and forth, like I'm trying things out, 
um, you may not take the time to do a useful commit message. So you get something really short that doesn't provide any context or details about, um, this is why I always pass, pass dash p to every, when I'm looking through the log, because I need to see what changed, because the message doesn't usually tell me. So if, if you take the time rebase, you can go back through and edit these messages or combine them into a useful message from a whole bunch of CSS fix. Um, but it's important to remember, if you're working with other open source projects outside of Drupal, is there's actually really strict commit messaging standards for bigger projects. Um, so don't be surprised if someone tells you that they, you know, first of all, you need to go learn how to amend and rebase because you need to edit these messages if you ever want to even dream of getting this pull request accepted. And that's something overall very important. Just like in your code, the comments should succinctly explain what and explain why in detail. Why you're doing this so that in the future, someone understands what you were doing. My favorite way to describe that is pretend the next person to be working on a project is a homicidal maniac who knows where you live. <laughs> so a summary. So, so we went through a lot of new commands. Um, in addition to these, these commands that you can use on any repository, we also introduce you to the concepts of you know, pull requests, rebasing, bisecting. Um, so, you know, th there was a lot thrown at you here. Git is, you know, this is, you know, still intermediate. It goes a whole nother level beyond this and, and then some. So um, don't be afraid to, you know, read through those Stack Overflow posts, you know, do a lot of research. Um, we've got some resources coming up on the next slide. So um, some, some things you might want to tackle or it might be a problem you're already facing and you need, you need to know that it's possible. Um, you, can, you can go in and rewrite history. Git's completely malleable. Um, you can use hooks, there, I mean this is a whole, I don't know, discipline into itself to, to do a whole lot of automation just with the git pushes and pulls and all, all of the commands that git does itself. It's a process that both Aqui and Pantheon use when you push to a branch that will then go and update your development site, doing other pulls or processes. So um, these, this pull request rebase workflow might soon come to your life on Drupal, especially if you contribute back to contrib modules or Drupal core itself. So um, there's a good video on this. There's a lot of issues about this as well. And um, I, I like the, uh, the, for finding some of these same advanced commands, um, Atlassian has done a lot of good documentation. You know, they, they have their um, projects that use Git heavily, so it was in their best interest to get people to use Git properly. So that's it for us. We got um, five minutes for questions. If anybody has anything. And they asked us to use the microphone if you have questions. I, I, I do not enforce that. Yeah. yeah. The question was, is there any strong opinions about squashing down to a single commit? So, you know, it's really just, you know, the homicidal maniac comment. It's like, when you're looking back through your own code, is it going to provide something useful? Or are you going to be starting from scratch and just looking at what changed rather than, like, the, the information that you provided? So, you know, it's 20 commits that change the same file and, or the same part of the same file, like, don't serve anybody in the future. I like, I like keeping the commits uh, more as a story. If, you, if there's this piece and this piece and this piece, squash down the ones so that it explains, you can see more of why, uh, what happened. So this is kind of a Drupal question <coughs> in relation to Git. When you install uh, Drupal, spin up a Drupal instance with Drush, it'll create the Git ignore file and it includes all the core files, what advantage is that to include files that you're not gonna change, if any? Um, generally, you, the files you don't wanna change or uh, build artifacts is on, on compiled systems. 
it, stuff that's going to be generated locally or changed locally, you don't want to put that into the repository. Uh, it's, it, many times your editor settings, those are, those are going to be specific to your, your machine, so you want to have those settings locally, but you don't want to push that off to someone else who doesn't need to use those specific settings. keeping track of people that are hacking core. I mean, that, that's a priority for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I actually created a Git hook that um, reminded me to fetch every time I was getting ready to do a merge conflict. So, I mean, it, it, it's... Um, The docs used to tell you to do that, and then Git got better and just got better at automatically merging. So yeah, th I, I would say use fetch. Like I, I always use fetch right before I, you know, know I'm going to get off a wi drop off a Wi-Fi. You know, it's like I, I want to know what's happening in that repo, and I can deal I can deal with those changes later. You know, so F fetch is a great tool. Like I do fetch dash dash all a lot on my repos now. It's one of those like nervous twitching, like, I, what's going on with this repo? Let's just pull it all down and see what's happening, so, yeah. Generally, a, uh, a git pull is equivalent to a, for, uh, a fetch and then merge. Yeah. So try not to ever do it. Yeah. No, uh, fetch and merge. Yeah. The if if, if you separate it. it out, you get a chance to pull back and, you know, stop yourself before you do something you didn't want to do. Yeah. yeah. And so generally, I never use pull anymore, except for the, to the master, from the master upstream. Because I'm never touching the master upstream, so I don't need to do fetch and merge because it's the same. I know that there's no, there's no, no new commits on that. So it may, may, maybe not everyone would. Uh, maybe you would have a Jenkins server that does it automatically for you, or or maybe you just have someone that's like you know the lead dev and they're responsible for production pushes. So that's all on their head to make sure that things stay up to date. Um, so yeah, so that that's a really useful way to use remotes is like access control over who actually gets to push to prod. Yeah, you have to go through the process of continue, or a, you can also use abort. But it's when you are rebasing, and it's just the simple one. Check and load that. Right there, the simple one. This example, uh, you don't need to do anything with the continue because there's not if there if there's no merge conflicts. That's only when you're doing an amend or, a mer or fixing a conflict or uh, actually not even squashing. It's just for the amending process of a commit. When you need to make a change to it, it's like, hey, I'm done. I've amended this commit. Now continue with the rebase. And so it actually, when you have like 30 of them, it'll count down one, two, three, four. And when you get to the fifth one, the one that you said to edit, it's going to stop. You can make whatever changes. You can delete files. You can edit the commit message and save. The, then you do git commit amend. And you've changed the commit. It actually changes the hash also. And then you say git commit, or sorry, git rebase continue. And it'll then start applying the, nest, the, the rest of the commits all the way down the line. Yes, there's, it's, it's, I mean, in terms of safety, it, Git is keeping track of all of your, 
uh, commits and your history. So it's safe either way to, to merge no pass forward. Automation kind of changes all the rules. Like, I mean, like, I, I would be more hesitant putting a force flag and running it from my own command line, but I might write a script that's going to always overwrite the, the, you know, the production server because I want to make sure those are always consistent, you know. So, like, if, if somebody hacked the server and put, pushed their own changes there or SSH in the server when they weren't supposed to, sorry, you know, that, that code's gone. You should have done it the proper way, so. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so when you're writing a script, you can break some of the rules because you know you, you can have a lot more heavy-handed because the last thing you want to do is introduce issues. So, like, it depends how it gets written, basically. Yeah. Two thousand five is when you wrote Git. Yeah. So, how did we see Teresa's two thousand one commit log message? Because uh, it was uh, converted from CSV. C CVS. CVS. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was converted, and there's all all the many projects were converted over at that time. If you ever find a CVS repository, there's really good open source tools that'll do that automatically. Preserve all the history, preserve the SVN, yep. mer Mercurial, like any 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 version control system can come into Git at this point. Like, I don't know, it might not go back 30 years, but you know, yeah. You mentioned checking out the, the password removal from from the repo, so from like a settings file or something like that. Yeah, from a settings file. Uh, I did a project last year that was an Android library that we, we were integrating the Android library with the, the Android UI, but the UI, they'd been separate repos, and it had been like, change the, the, the images and the backgrounds and the URL to the server for this project, and, that, and then the next project, it just kept getting committed onto the UI project, and then the whole, the whole project was uh, done together, and what I did was, bring those two projects together and make it so we could GPL the whole thing. And so I, what I had to do was go into the history and pull out all the passwords and custom settings and all the old binary files. So that, because what it did, it brought down the project from, I think it was like 50, 60 megabytes down to four because it was just the, the simple backgrounds. And Every, all the passwords and everything had been removed. I took out all these extraneous files. A good uh, script for that is called BFG, named after the gun in Doom. <laughs> and that will go through, and it uses the uh, git filter branch command, yeah. but it automated, automate, automates it for you. Yeah, P people get attached to their history, and sometimes it's not actually as valuable as you think it is, especially after a certain point, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the mic's not that, working. Yeah, the, it's out of battery, I think. Yeah. Um, I'll stand up. I, I, um, I'm fairly new to Drupal, but I don't understand how you can do Drupal and, and do Git at the same time, because it's like a, almost like a WYSIWYG kind of, so say I build a view, or I build a content, or content type of field, or, or whatever, install a couple modules, would I just write that in Git, like I installed this, this, and this, and put the settings, like, so, so, so Drupal stores everything in the database, especially in Drupal 7. Uh, there's a module called Features that lets you save that down to configuration files. And in Drupal 8, luckily, like thankfully for, you know, we finally have a full configuration management system. And so that often gets committed to the repo and managed through Git. Um, so now every, every one of those changes, we can actually export it, save it into the repository, and then move it between environments. 7 and 8 or just 8? 7 has features. It's partially functions. Eight has has 95%. built it from the ground up with CMI, so you know it's it's there hundred percent. Like every configuration set setting should be there in CMI in one form or another. So, yeah. Also though, even without that stuff, you're changing the theme of your site and that's all within the files. Yeah. If you're checking a checkbox, that's configuration. Like that's the way I like to think about it. So, there's a lot of checking checkboxes in Drupal. Yeah. That's it. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks a lot.